Hello everyone, my name is Libby and today I will be your local expert on cryogenic electron microscopy. Cryogenic electron microscopy is a microscopy technique for imaging biological molecules at a near atomic resolution. It's applied on samples cooled to cryogenic temperatures to visualize the macromolecular structures in their native state, which gives us a lot more detail for understanding cellular processes. That process is shown in the figure here. The single particle analysis technique begins with the sample vitrification. During this process, the protein solution is instantly cooled so that the water molecules do not crystallize, and this forms an amorphous solid. The frozen sample is then screened and data is collected in the system, and a series of two-dimensional images can be taken during this period. Next, based off of those two-dimensional images, particle alignment and classification are carried out. In the end, the data is processed by reconstruction software to generate a three-dimensional structure model. But like with any method, there needs to be some sample preparation controls in place. For the controls employed in cryo-electron microscopy, there is no shortage of examples. A common one is a negative staining control, which is imaging samples that have been negatively stained to enhance the contrast with the native samples, revealing more structural details. Another is a buffer control. Imaging the buffer alone without the sample can help identify any contaminants introduced during the imaging process. The images on this slide are from my first manuscript published in 2019, which is an examination of current outcomes when optimizing standard sample preparation controls for single particle cryo-electron microscopy. The preparation of frozen hydrated samples on electron microscopy grids can be quite challenging, and this experiment wanted to summarize some of their collective experiences to help optimize the sample preparation. I think it goes without saying, but optimizing your controls during sample prep is the most surefire way to get the best results possible in the end. The images on the left are six examples of what samples look like when the first few trials were not done properly. Some of the problems in the initial screens were extensive particle aggregation when thin films were prepped on EM grids, shown in A, clumping of filamentous particles, shown in C, and disintegration of particles into smaller pieces in E and F. The six examples on the right are successful control trials, and the images are a lot cleaner and yielded much better results. They concluded that the best method requires further testing and that the process to prepare these cryogrids itself is very sensitive and susceptible to different changes. But with all of these controls, as well as plenty more that I didn't mention, all collectively contribute to the reliability of the data and accuracy of the 3D reconstructions, and make sure that the observed structures are a true representation of the biological specimens. And when these experiments are done properly, there are a lot of advantages to using this method. Cryo-EM is well suited for capturing dynamic biological processes and interactions. It can capture multiple conformational states in a single imaging session. This image on the bottom right is the molecule ISRIB, and this image is showing how it interacts with the protein, giving researchers insight into how it works in the human body. Cryo-EM is also proven effective in the structural determination of membrane proteins at different sizes, which is usually pretty challenging to crystallize. This image on the top left shows one study's progress in the current size limitations of membrane protein structures determined by cryo-electron microscopy. It also allows the visualization of viral capsids, envelopes, and surface proteins, aiding in vaccine development, antiviral drug design, and understanding viral assembly, replication, and infection mechanisms. One of the most recent advances in this field is related to the structure of spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 Omicron virus, shown in the image on the bottom left. The field of cryo-EM is experiencing rapid technological advancements, making high-resolution structural biology more accessible to researchers. This image on the top right is a comparison of how much the imaging has improved from 2013 to 2017, and the technology has only gotten more advanced since then. But as many advantages as there are, cryo-EM is not the only research technique for structural biology. There are three main research techniques for structural biology. The other two methods are single crystal X-ray diffraction and nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR. But there is no all-purpose method. All three of them offer their own advantages and disadvantages. I touched on cryo-EM's advantages already, but when directly comparing it to these other methods, it has an easier sample preparation, less sample needs to be used, and it can remain in its native state. But when compared to the other methods, the resolution is a lot lower and less dynamic, especially when compared to NMR. There are limitations to cryo-EM, and two of the most significant disadvantages are its need for high-quality samples and its cost. The control examples I showed a few slides ago really highlight how sensitive the preparation can be. And as far as the cost goes, a high-end cryogenic transmission electron microscope can cost upwards of $2 million. Not to mention the direct electron detectors, which are required for high resolution and can cost an additional half million to one million dollars. Not cheap. 
but each of these methods have their own advantages and disadvantages with certain applications. Speaking of comparing methods, in this next study, the authors described using an integrated structure that used both NMR and EM method data simultaneously and allowed them to determine the structure of a 468 KDA dodecamuric aminopeptidase TET2 enzyme complex. They had to do this because NMR structure determination is difficult for proteins with a molecular weight above 30 KDA, and cryo-EM does not routinely give access to atomic level structural data, especially in 2019 when this study was performed. If we look at their final figure here, in A, they present an overall view highlighting one of the 12 modeled subunits refined against both NMR and EM data. Moving to B, it shows a bundle of 10 structures for one subunit with very high accuracy. Inside the circle, it shows a loop region that was absent in the original crystal structure and seen in the interior cavity in C with a zoomed in view in D. They achieved a structure with precision that had surpassed current NMR and EM standards. Their approach works even with a medium resolution cryo-EM data and can provide a valuable solution for more challenging cases in future studies. Since this is such a rapidly evolving method, I wanted to include a manuscript that highlighted more of the recent advancements in both single particle analysis, cryo-EM, and cryo-electron tomography. These have facilitated the determination of higher resolution biomolecular structures that are not available with other methods. This specific study reviewed current developments in SPA cryo-EM and cryo-ET that push these boundaries. Various time-resolved cryo-EM methods are used to capture reactions happening at different speeds in various specimens, shown here in row one. Spraying mixing is good for small molecules that mix well, while mixing spraying works for reactants of both small and large sizes. Light-based time-resolved cryo-EM is limited to specimens sensitive to light, and recent tech innovations shown in row 3 are improving the challenges in preparing samples and making time-resolved cryo-EM devices more reliable and accessible, automating much of the process shown in row 2. New techniques are making it easier to study molecules in their natural environments using methods like SPA and cryo-ET. These were once separate but are now converging due to the demand for detailed studies of molecules in action. Recent advances like time-resolved cryo-EM and cryo-FIB milling also provide unprecedented resolution, but they are costly. There is a pressing need for affordable access to these tools to make cryo-EM more widely accessible. For my final slide, I wanted to show some truly incredible structures that cryo-EM has given us the ability to capture, courtesy of NCBI's structure library. Beyond scientific curiosity, cryo-EM complements cell cultures by providing detailed insights into the structural organization of cellular components helping researchers understand these cellular processes at the molecular level. It can also tie into studies involving transvection and luciferase reporter assays by visualizing these structures of macromolecules involved in gene expression. The detailed insights it provides aid in studying protein-protein interactions by visualizing the 3D structures of interacting proteins, providing valuable insight into the cellular signaling pathways. Cryo-EM is truly a catalyst for breakthroughs that enable us to uncover the mysteries that underlie the fundamental processes of life. Its impact extends far beyond the scientific community, influencing our approach to biomedical research and opening new avenues for exploration in the future. And that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you all so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it.